Well, it's time. Time to get back to the final episodes of the Napoleonic Wars from Epic History TV. We're going to watch through this and learn together. If you haven't seen the series up to this point, there's a link in the description to take you back to the beginning of my reaction series, which goes back a couple of years and very different kind of quality of content and presentation than it was now but it's an exciting series epic history did a fantastic job with it i'll put the link in the description to their original content one of the most highly recommended channels on youtube if you're looking to learn more about history definitely check them out we're in the home stretch now this is napoleon 1813 the road to leipzig leipzig is going to be one of his most disastrous defeats on the battlefield it's a battle sometimes known as the battle of the nations and that's a battlefield i very much hope to get to someday Let's go ahead and dive in. The spell is broken. 1812 had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. It's crazy. Now, Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. And see, this is the problem. It's not simply a matter of Napoleon having a failed invasion of Russia because he underestimated the Russian people, he underestimated their will, he underestimated the nature of the campaign. But now you've lost a half a million men and you've left your eastern borders wide open to counterattack and basically you haven't just lost an attack you've lost your em empire at this point he just doesn't know it yet or it just hasn't happened yet some advised emperor alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with napoleon russia's own armies had been mauled and western russia devastated but alexander was determined to see napoleon defeated for good to free Europe from his clutches and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Yeah, as we talked about in earlier episodes, you got to remember that by this point, Napoleon's not leading an army of diehard, loyal French professional soldiers. He's got a hodgepodge of different soldiers of different quality levels, some conscript, some more professional from various nations, many of whom are only kind of loyal to him. They're only on his side so long as they have to be or so long as it makes sense for them to do so. The moment an opportunity presents itself for them to change allegiances, and this includes some of Napoleon's own most loyal people. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples. Time to start watching out for yourself, right? He's, he's thinking about his own kingdom that he's been given. He's not thinking about saving Napoleon's hide. He's thinking, okay, I'm done. You know, Napoleon's done. I'm gonna try and save what I've got. Hoping to cut a deal with the allies that would let him keep his throne not going to happen. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, yep. and now faced odds of four to one. You know, there are some generals who are fantastic in their role. You know, I think, for example, of people in the American Civil War, someone like uh, Richard Yule, who was a fantastic brigade and division commander, but when he wrote, was risen to corps level, didn't perform all that well in that situation. Uh, another example would be someone like Stonewall Jackson, who actually kind of had a mixed bag, where when he had independent command uh, and he had advantages, he did really well, but there were times when Working under Robert E. Lee, we all think of Chancellorsville and how great he did, but there were also some pretty bad blunders where he did not perform well. Uh, some people do well in certain situations, in certain roles, but not so great in others. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. 
On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Just like that. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin. Think about how fast this is happening. Warsaw falls, and three weeks later, Berlin falls. This is not mobile warfare with tanks and mechanized vehicles. These are men on foot, some men on horseback, moving with artillery pieces and all those sorts of things. This is a quick turnaround from Napoleon being in Russia with a half a million men to being all the way back now to Central Europe. While Sweden joined the Allies. Sweden led by Sweden a former was ruled by Marshal. Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johann. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests. This reminds me a lot of what happens uh, many, many centuries earlier in England, where you have the King of England appointing one of his best friends to be Archbishop of Canterbury so he can conceivably get more influence and control of church affairs but when uh, Thomas Beckett takes on the role of archbishop he says no my loyalty is no longer to you like it was when I was a politician now I'm clergy and I'm going to act in the best interests of God and the church same things happen here when Napoleon appoints one of his marshals thinking he's got a very loyal uh, leader in Sweden like he's got in places like Spain with his brother and places like Naples, but doesn't happen. And Bernadotte's family, I think, is still on the throne of Sweden. Which is what he now claimed to do. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. They're done. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. And Napoleon has taken on, obviously, right, this is the War of the Sixth Coalition. There have been five before that. Napoleon's always been able to navigate that and take on these multiple nations. But he's never been in a weaker position than he is now. And he's never faced this level of opposition from so many places all at once. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. Britain just throwing this money around like nobody's business right now, right? And I think by this point, they're actually known as the United Kingdom uh, of Great Britain and Ireland. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany, and mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's mm. honor. In what would soon be known, as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training tactics and drill we're seeing the birth of the 19th century prussian army that is going to become the dominant military force in europe by the end of the century when napoleon met the new prussian army in battle two months later he remarked these animals have learned something mm -hmm. small consolation they'd learned most of it from him Tough for a guy not like, like Napoleon to face this. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, 
it's amazing to me he's continuing to be able to find soldiers to field in this army, especially after losing a half a million men in his most uh, recent campaign, and, and obviously millions of casualties already having taken place in the Napoleonic Wars. So you have to figure you're kind of scraping the bottom of the proverbial barrel at this point. And laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 Marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defence force, were transferred to Germany. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw, two-thirds were teenagers, and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. And we see that happening in, in every war, right? It happened in World War I, happens in World War II. Um, and, and that can cause you to have to adjust your tactics. You can't do the same kinds of things you did when you had this great professional, well-trained army. Um, it also means that maybe your enemy can maybe miss interpret what you're capable of and uh, just it causes a lot of things that maybe you could have done 10 years earlier that you can't do now. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines. So Austria, home of Napoleon's wife, uh, so he can't even get the marriage alliance that he made to come through for him at this point. So far declining to back either side. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organisation meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. It's amazing. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. Wow, didn't know that. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home, their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. So somebody mentioned this uh, in a comment on a recent video that now you have the opposite problem, right? If, if Russia's got this great strength in terms of the size of their nation and the number of people they have, uh, which can draw people in and extend them far beyond their supply lines and their base, they have the opposite problem too, which is that often they have to go from deep within their own territory to get anywhere, and now they are facing the problem that Napoleon once faced, which is they're stretching far from home, they're going deeper and deeper into what had been hostile territory. I don't think it's quite as bad as what Napoleon faced, because a lot of this territory that they're marching through is kind of coming in on their side, but it's still difficult. Russia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilise their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men, to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies. 
And think about how huge that would be. Austria is right there on the southern flank of this entire uh, coalition advance. That's going to threaten Prussia. It's going to threaten to uh, once again turn uh, the Duchy of Warsaw to their side. It's going to be right on the border of Russia as well. It would be huge to get Austria on their side. Allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland and re-establish his dominance over Europe. It's possible. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. So this is the gamble you take, right? You're, you're, you're hedging your bets. You're thinking, yeah, it's Napoleon. We know how good he is on a battlefield. Yes, he's got speed and he's got numbers, but he's also, how much do those numbers really count for when they're really hastily called up troops with very little training, very little experience, and he doesn't have a lot of things like cavalry? We are going to take our chances. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. The eyes and ears. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. That's brutal. You already don't have a lot in terms of cavalry. You're already kind of flying blind without enough uh, scouting and reconnaissance. And now you lose this guy. Jeez, this is brutal stuff. Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action. And like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's 3rd Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught. On and that's a, that's a typical Napoleonic tactic, right? You get an opportunity to strike at one small part of his force before he can gather everybody. That's what Napoleon's always trying to do. It's what he'll try to do at Waterloo. Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. And if you think you're recognizing a lot of these names, even if you're not familiar with Napoleonic Wars, there's a reason for that. A lot of these names, like Scharnhorst and Blücher, these are going to become very famous German naval vessels during the First and Second World War. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. 
neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. History is decided by things like that. Misunderstandings, delays, unexpected complications. Little things that turn the tide. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. Look at these numbers. My goodness. There were I more. mean, that that right there, Bautzen, it's not even a battle we really talk about that often, right? It's not one of the big ones, so to speak. But the French casualties are equal to what the Union and Confederate casualties were, uh, either one, not both together, at the Battle of Gettysburg, the bloodiest battle in the Western Hemisphere ever. Uh, each side suffered 20-some thousand casualties. This is, these are crazy numbers, and this happened over and over and over again. Or casualties during the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, dropping like and flies. his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. Wow. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry. I think that's, uh, that's where the Red Baron was born, in Breslau, pretty sure. While Udino was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian Corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, Neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Yeah. To the surprise of many, but Napoleon, no, this, this is an indication that Napoleon, despite the fact that he's fighting, that he's on the offensive, he understands the gravity of the situation and the precariousness of where he is right now. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops. Even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, Marie-Louise, in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took centre stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, Mm -hmm. Which would to Why? Because Austria, the Austrian Emperor's son-in-law is Napoleon. So a strong Napoleon on the side of Austria is in Austria's best interest. Much power to Russia. In June, he travelled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. So, what do you do if you're Napoleon in this situation? I mean, if you're saying no to this stuff, you have to at least somewhat believe you can win on the battlefield. Uh, and, I, you know, in hindsight, I just don't see how 
he thought that rejecting this, maybe he didn't think that the Austrians were serious, that they would jump in on the uh, side of the coalition with their 200,000 men. Maybe he thought they'd stay neutral. Uh, it's obviously a miscalculation on his part. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. So here now he has the choice between hang on to France and maybe a little bit more territory, give up most of the rest, or try to hang on to all of it, but that means you got to win on the battlefield. He was wrong. Interesting. Can't beat him, but you can beat everybody else. On the 12th of August 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of 3 to 2, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognising Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks and wear down French forces until it was time to close in for the kill. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including 8 million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition. <laughs> Britain is still just throwing money and supplies around like candy, it's crazy. 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of Jeez. beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. Gotta have that. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Victoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia. See, me not being a trained military commander with years of experience winning battles, I'm thinking if you're that heavily outnumbered, you sit back and let them come to you. But Napoleon is, this is still, it's the mindset that we would know as the cult of the offensive later on. Um, if you attack, you control the situation you can determine what happens. If you sit back and wait, yeah, you're in a stronger, more advantageous position by being on the defense, but you are allowing your enemy to dictate the circumstances. So he's taking a calculated risk that by going on the offensive, he's in better control of the situation. Commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. When you have an army of a coalition like this, it's all about 
coordination, working together, everybody agreeing to and sticking to the plan. And they're sticking to the plan here. Blucher's like, no, nah, I'm withdrawing. It's Napoleon. Our, our goal is to hit his marshals. Drawing him away. And now this massive army comes up and hits one of his marshals. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blucher and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank. Just a, just kind of a couple of general observations here. Number one, it's amazing how often these battles of the Napoleonic Wars are taking places along taking place along rivers, with bridges being a key part of them. And the other thing is just to once again point out what a fantastic job Epic History TV does with this series, because it's so easy. These are very complicated events with a lot of moving parts and a lot of people involved and all these huge battles. And they're doing a great job of telling the story in such a way that not only immerses you into it with the sounds and the, and the images, but also you can follow it because they use the maps and everything. So well, so well done and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. Look at those numbers, 38,000 casualties. And yeah, he said they ignored the rule, right? Of course, did they know? That's a question, I guess, because when they first attack, Napoleon's off chasing the Germans, right? Chasing the Prussians uh, while this Austrian army comes up. I don't know, maybe did, maybe did they not know? Or maybe by the time they found out Napoleon was there, it was too late and they committed. Didn't work out. Battle. <clears throat> but news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Two German states fighting against each other, one of Napoleon's marshals taking on one of Napoleon's former marshals. Fascinating stuff. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald driving some French troops into the river itself. Napoleon can't be everywhere. When It's completely true what they said. Hit his marshals, you can win. Fight him, you'll probably lose. Until the advantage is so overwhelming, Napoleon can't win. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and 100 guns for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. This is like... Three or four battles now, just in the span of a couple of months in one campaign that are all bigger than the Battle of Gettysburg. I mean, the perspective on this is just, it's insane, the size of these battles. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Udino, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned.
in just 10 days. Mm. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied... And notice all of those battles happen at the same time. There's a battle here, a battle up there near Berlin, the battle down here near Dresden, all happening at the same time. Napoleon can't be all those places. It's incredible coordination or just some really good luck for that to work out that way. Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. Stick to the plan. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. Mm. Yeah, understatement. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides, and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. And what's amazing to me, obviously, is as you're thinking of all of this, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of men all operating in a small area of Europe that all need to be fed, that all need to find places to sleep and are all needing to go to the bathroom and all of these logistics that are happening. The civilian populace has got to be suffering in major ways. And of course, all of that is to say that uh, this is just can't continue. It can't continue for a long period of time. At some point, you've got to have a decisive battle. Something has to change. Uh, because they're just going to run out of everything. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Mm. What a battle it is. All right, so we're going to get into the battle of the nations, I think, in the next episode. Man, there's so much to learn because every one of these battles that we're talking about, we could do an entire video just on that battle alone there's so much to learn here and i'm i'm so intrigued to want to know more so we will definitely dive into more of this in the future once we finish this series but for now use the comment section below and add to the conversation let us continue to learn together check out some of epic history tv's other content we'll see you again soon thanks for watching